The uh, joint subcommittees will come to order. We're going to start with a short 50-second uh, video clip. Safe spaces, safe zones, shout downs, um, microaggressions, bias response teams, and as we saw from the video, even riots on campus today. We want to thank you all for joining us uh, in, in the audience and uh, certainly our witnesses today. This is our second in a series of hearings to highlight the First, uh, first Amendment. The history of intellectual growth and discovery clearly demonstrates the need for unfettered freedom, the right to think the unthinkable, discuss the unmentionable, and challenge the unchallengeable. That quote, taken from the 1974 Woodward Report at Yale, summarizes the policy that was for years the gold standard of what free speech on campus should look like. College is a place for young minds to be intellectually bombarded with new, challenging ideas. Unfortunately, Today on many campuses, students and faculty are forced into self-censorship out of a fear of triggering, violating a safe space, a microaggression, or being targeted by a biased response team. Restricting speech that does not conform to popular opinion, opinion contradicts the First Amendment principles and the right to speak freely without regard to offensiveness. Shoutdowns, disinvitations, and even violent writing, as we saw in the video, are some of the tactics used to silence opposing views. This committee is committed to help colleges reinstate the freedom of speech as an important protection. After all, it's no coincidence that the Constitution's framers prioritized the freedom of speech in the first, the first Amendment. I want to show one other quick video clip before we get to our panel, and this is about 20 seconds. We can show that real quick. Okay, so, so the priority is that they stay in that room. If they aren't in that room, yeah. then we did something wrong. So you all need to watch that door, watch all the doors, watch the windows, and you need to keep eyes on them. And somebody needs to go in that room real quick to make sure that there's no way in that room for them to leave. That's the number one priority. And so we get our demands here. Are y'all clear? Cool. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hold. This is where it all ends. You start with the safe spaces, safe zone, trigger warnings, microaggressions, bias response teams, and even riots, as we saw in the first video. And where does it end? It ends with students holding hostage a president of the university, and he has to ask permission to go to the men's room. That's why we're having this hearing. That's why we're highlighting the attacks on the First Amendment. Mr. Shapiro. It's an honor to testify before you here today. The reason that I'm with you is that I speak on dozens of college campuses every year, so I have some firsthand experience with the anti-First Amendment activities that have been taking place on, on the college campuses. I've encountered anti-free speech measures, administrative cowardice, even physical violence at campuses ranging from California State University at Los Angeles to University of Wisconsin at Madison, which is driving the legislation uh, that Ms. Demings was talking about, uh, to Penn State University to UC Berkeley, and I am not alone. In order to understand what's been going on at some of our college campuses, it's necessary to explore the ideology that provides the impetus for a lot of the protesters who violently obstruct events, pull fire alarms, assault professors and even other students, and the impetus for administrators who all too often humor these protesters. Free speech is under assault because of a three-step argument made by the advocates and justifiers of violence. The first step is they say that the validity or invalidity of an argument can be judged solely by the ethnic, sexual, racial, or cultural identity of the person making the argument. The second step is that they claim those who say otherwise are engaging in what they call verbal violence. And the final step is they conclude that physical violence is sometimes justified in order to stop such verbal violence. So let's examine each of these three steps in turn. First, the philosophy of intersectionality. 
This philosophy now dominates college campuses as well as a large segment, unfortunately, of today's Democratic Party and suggests that straight white Americans are inherently the beneficiaries of white privilege and therefore cannot speak on certain policies since they have not experienced what it's like to be black or Hispanic or gay or transgender or a woman. This philosophy ranks the value of a view not based on the logic or merit of the view, but on the level of victimization in American society experienced by the person espousing the view. Therefore, if you're an LGBT black woman, your view of American society is automatically more valuable than that of a straight white male. The next step in the logic is obvious. If a straight white male or anybody else who ranks lower on the victimhood scale says something contrary to the viewpoint of the higher ranking intersectional, intersectionality identity, that person has engaged in a microaggression. As NYU social psychologist Jonathan Haidt writes, microaggressions are small actions or word choices that seem on their face to have no malicious intent, but that are thought of as a kind of violence nonetheless. You don't have to actively say anything insulting to microaggress. Somebody merely needs to take offense. If, for example, you say that society ought to be colorblind, you're microaggressing certain identity groups who have been victimized by a non-colorblind society. Note, microaggressions, as the name suggests, are not merely insults. They are aggressions. They are the equivalent to physical violence. Just two weeks ago, psychologist Lisa Feldman Barrett of Northeastern University published an essay in the New York Times suggesting that words should be seen as physical violence because they can cause stress and stress causes physical harm. Thus, Feldman suggested it is reasonable, scientifically speaking, to ban or restrict speech you do not like at your school. This is both inane and dangerous. That's because it leads to the final logical step. Words you don't like deserve to be fought physically. When I spoke at California State University LA, one professor threatened students who sponsored me by offering to fight them. He then posted a slogan on the door of his office stating, the best response to microaggression is macroaggression. As Haidt writes, this is why the idea that speech is violence is so dangerous. It tells the members of a generation already beset by anxiety and depression that the world is a far more violent and threatening place than it really is. It tells them that words, ideas, speakers can literally kill them, even worse. At a time of rapidly rising political polarization in the United States, it helps a small subset of that generation justify political violence. Indeed, protesters all too often engage in physically violent disruption when they believe their identity group is under verbal attack by someone, usually conservative, but not always. Not only do some administrators look the other way, at Middlebury College, Cal State LA, Berkeley, Evergreen, actual crimes were committed and almost nobody has been arrested, but they actively forbid events from moving forward, creating a heckler's veto. The notion that if you are physically violent enough, you can get administrators to kowtow to you, to bow before you, by canceling an event you disagree with altogether. All of this destroys free speech. But just as importantly, it turns students into snow, snowflakes, craven and pathetic, looking for an excuse to be offended so they can earn points in the intersectionality Olympics and then use those points as a club with which to beat opponents. A healthy nation requires an emotionally and intellectually vigorous population ready to engage in open debate at all times. Shielding college students from opposing viewpoints makes them simultaneously weaker and more dangerous. We must fight that process at every step. And that begins by acknowledging that whatever we think about America and where we stand, we must agree on this fundamental principle. All of our views should be judged on their merits, not on the color or sex or sexual orientation of the speaker, and those views should never be banned on the grounds that they offend someone. Thanks so much. Mr. Shapiro, would the, the professors you cited in your testimony view your four minute and 48 second opening statement as a microaggression? <laughs> I assume that some of them would. I mean, it, the, apparently college students do all the time since when I speak there, I've been, I think there have been riots and such. I think they definitely will, which is kind of the sign of the times, I guess. Mr. Carolla, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, it's an honor to be asked uh, to speak in front of you all. Uh, first, just a quick piece of business. Do we get to keep these pads? <laughs> This is going to be huge. <laughs> and uh, not that I'm going to, but what do you reckon they'll get on eBay? <laughs> I'm not I'm saying I'm going to. I'm just it's yeah. pure curiosity. Uh, I, uh, I, uh, I'm not as eloquent as uh, Mr. Shapiro. I sort of speak in uh, beats and um, off the top of my head. And I've written a few uh, down for you all today. Uh, first off, I come from a, a very blue collar background. I grew up in uh, North Hollywood, California. Uh, my dad was a, a school teacher and my mom received uh, welfare and food stamps and uh, told me very importantly when I was young, when I asked her if she would get a job, she said, and lose my welfare benefits, no thank you. That, which uh, taught me a very valuable lesson, which was uh, never to listen to my mom. All right. <laughs> 
Uh, I ended up being a carpenter and then a, a boxing instructor and met Jimmy Kimmel when I taught him to box for a uh, morning zoo stunt and eventually made my way onto uh, TV and radio. Uh, in the early days of my career, I toured the country with Dr. Drew when we are on Loveline together, a syndicated radio program also on MTV, and we must have played a hundred college campuses with uh, nary a word of negativity and no safe spaces and no stuffed animals being handed out, simply went there, said our piece, many controversial ideas were exchanged and that's just what they were, exchanged and then we got our paychecks and went home and 15 years later I went out with uh, Dennis Prager, conservative talk show host, and attempted to do a show at uh, Cal State Northridge, where my mother was a actual graduate from with a Chicano studies degree, believe it or not. So she's rolling in dough about now. <laughs> uh, and uh, they pulled the plug on it. They gave us no good reason why we couldn't speak there, and we actually had to get attorneys involved to go back and speak at a later date. Um, we're talking a lot about the kids, and I think they're just that, kids. We are the adults, and I don't think we are doing the children. I mean, these are 18 and 19-year-old kids that are at these college campuses. They grew up dipped in Purell, playing soccer games where they never kept score and watching Wah Wah Wubsy, and we're asking them to be mature. We need the adults to start being the adults. Um, studies have shown that if you take people and you put them in a zero gravity environment, like astronauts, they lose muscle mass, they lose bone density. We're taking these kids in the name of protection, we're putting them in a zero gravity environment, and they're losing muscle mass and bone density. They need to live in a world that has gravity. When you, you need to expose your children to germs and dirt in the environment to build up their immune system. Our plan is, put them in a bubble, keep them away from everything, and somehow they'll come out stronger when they emerge from the bubble. Well, that's not happening. Children are the future, but we are the present, and we're the adults, and we need to act like it. And I feel that um, what's going on on these campuses is we need law and order. We need to bring back law and order, but I think if we just had order, we wouldn't need law. So could we just bring back order and could the faculty and administration on these campuses act like faculty and administration and most importantly, adults who are in charge of these kids who need some gravity in their life. Thank you.